Semple didn't need to check the English Country Garden's calendar in the kitchen to know that it was the first anniversary of Emma's death. He felt it in his bones. The Emma Gray lorry driver that killed his wife of 30 years had been glued to his mobile, unmindful of his vehicle's speed, nor was he watching the on-rushing crosswalk. At his arrest, the young Pole swore the old woman stepped from the curb, oblivious to traffic. Old woman, Semple bristled, Emma was only 55. The items that spilled from his wife's torn Tesco carrier bag were testament to the collision's violence. There was a squashed loaf of bread, patterned by tire tracks and dimpled with gravel, two liters worth of milk, a thin coat covering the pavement, and a package of fresh chicken thighs flattened into a grayish pink pate. The driver's employer did not contest the court's decision to award Semple a substantial cash settlement. They booted the fellow back to his native land, fearful that some hungry young solicitor might convince Semple to instigate a lawsuit. For their part, the local council hastened to have an LED pedestrian crossing light installed at the accident scene. Semple's adult daughters had rushed from their jobs on the continent, Brexit be damned, to help him navigate the funeral and its immediate aftermath. Emma's co-workers from the local Oxfam office attended the chapel service. As the Semples weren't regular churchgoers, the young Methodist minister delivered a generic homily. Semple looked away when the jerky conveyor transported the wooden casket into the crematorium chamber to the accompaniment of a CD of Abide With Me played over a crackling sound system. For some time, Semple had contemplated becoming a fantasy writer. Conversations he had had with the owner of the bookshop on the high street convinced him that, with a little luck, he might shoulder his way in between the giants, Bilbo Baggins, and Harry Potter. A month after the funeral, Semple took early retirement from the marketing firm. He spared no time in transforming Emma's sewing room into his airy. A woman's shelter received the sewing machine, the myriad spools of thread in a rainbow of colors, and a pile of unfinished projects. The flowered wallpaper was scraped off, nail holes were spackled, and the walls were painted a neutral color. A sturdy bookshelf was stalled above the Ikea desk he'd assembled. The shorter Oxford English Dictionary held pride of place among the reference works there. A brand new laptop, a large flat screen monitor, and a Wi-Fi printer were the finishing touches. Sunshiny skies and mild temperatures were augured well for the inaugural day of Semple's endeavor. Fortified by a breakfast of buttered wheat toast with strawberry jam and a cup of Arabica coffee, he settled into his desk chair and turned on the computer. The doorbell buzzed and he went downstairs. Rose Chamberlain was on the stoop. For many years, Mrs. Chamberlain had been their weekly charwoman. A dependable soul, she didn't have the sticky fingers of so many domestics. I've come to give my notice, Mr. Semple. You'll recall that Alfred has retired. Our son and his partner had invited us to live with them in Edinburgh. Semple congratulated Rose on her good fortune, wrote out a generous final check for her services, and wished her and her husband well in the north. Passing through the kitchen after she departed, he considered the breakfast dishes in the sink. Could he keep the place clean on his own? Semple washed and dried the cup, saucer, dish, and utensils. Returning the items to their storage places, he felt confident that everything was under control. A week passed. Semple hadn't churned out as many manuscript pages as he'd hoped, but he remained upbeat. He was confident that his novel about a young widowed noble woman named Alla had real potential. Its working title was The Siege of Castle Askerton. As Semple had a tendency to nod off after lunch, he began tuning into BBC Radio 4 online as the workday commenced. The white noise provided by its news and arts programs, even The Archers, which set his teeth on edge, 
help fend off drowsiness. In the wake of a productive day, he made a trip to his local, the Red Lion. Pub grub and beer were bad for his waistline, but he deserved a break from the microwave fare that often formed the foundation of his tea. Hearing a rumble of thunder, Semple dropped his key ring on a small rosewood table in the hall and plucked an umbrella from the doorstand. In the act of retrieving the keys, his fingers marred the dust coating the tabletop. Was housework going to pose more of a challenge than he imagined? The drumbeat of rain on the roof made Semple abandon thoughts of going out. He walked through the house instead. Furniture in some rooms needed dusting. Cobwebs lurked in a few ceiling corners. The rugs could use a thorough hoovering. The windows were streaky. The reconnaissance made Semple decide to find a replacement for Mrs. Chamberlain without delay. Semple headed for the high street on Wednesday morning. He carried a roll of sellotape and copies of an advertisement that he had worked up. Live-in housekeeper sought. Widower of quiet habits, a writer by vocation, seeks a live-in housekeeper. Duties include cleaning, washing, and cooking. Salary commensurate with experience. References required. Please apply in person between 6 and 8 weekday evenings. 232 Wisteria Lane. Nowadays, a plethora of online sites enabled employers and prospective employees to link up, but Semple favored the traditional approach. He had been reticent to solicit live-in help, as someone banging around was a potential distraction to his writing. Then he concluded that having all his household needs met was worth the risk. Semple posted his advert in upscale shops display windows, believing that that placement would attract a better sort of applicant. His task accomplished, he considered the type of person he hoped would apply. A pleasant, mature woman would be just the ticket. To be continued.